profesor, ¿se va a grabar esta reunión? Eh, sí, así es. Sí, buenos días a todos. Sí. Buenos Se días. Sí. Luego subimos la. ¿Va por la correo? Liga. O sea, igual. Perdóname. Nos mandará la. La liga del Celan Mando, sí, así es. No sé si me pueda quedar toda, todo el tiempo. Ok. Gracias. Sí, de nada. Ah, estás en la oficina, Hugo. ¿Cómo está Ramón? Sí, así ¿Qué es. Tal? Sí, okay. aquí estamos. Hola, paisano. ¿Qué tal, paisano? ¿Cómo estás? Bien, bien. Hugo. ¿Cómo estás, Juan Carlos? Qué vole. Y en mitad de bloque de clase, mitad donde los chavos trabajan y yo, y yo veo conferencias. Dale. Ajá, rey, por eso tienen el cubrebocas, pues. Sí, sí, sí. Estoy esperando a la expositora. Uh -huh. ¿Cómo está Ramón? ¿Todo bien? Bien, sí, este, seguimos aquí en San Luis. Ajá. Bueno, no se ve porque pues, se puse un background. Ajá, sí. Pero, este, ahí seguimos en, en, en San Luis y este, estoy dando una clase en el Itson. Ok. Y, este, y pues por lo demás seguimos aquí participando en comités de tesis y eso. Perfecto. Pues para apoyar el posgrado. Y dar la de taller, ¿no? También. ¿La de qué? La de taller para la investigación, ¿no? Con, con Gilberto Chó. Fíjate que no, de... este... Ah, no. Esa, esa no la estoy dando, no. Ah. Este, el, la di un semestre con ellos. Ok. Y, pero luego sí ya empecé a encontrar dificultades este, para participar en eso. Aquí está el Itza. Caray, Raúl Monroy es igualito a ti, Hugo. Ahora no, ya tomó mi personalidad. Ay, ya está el Itza aquí. Voy a ser co-host. Hola Elisa, no, no, no oyes este a nadie de los de aquí. ¿Me escucha? Muy mal. Ahora, ahora sí escucho yo ya algo. Está muy ruidoso, Raúl. Bueno, a mí me escuchan bien. Bueno. Así, a ti te escucho bien, Hugo. Ok. Sí, Voy a, voy, a, voy a hacerte eh, co-host, uh, Elisa, para que tú tengas también todo. Ahí está. Entonces, ¿querías hacer post a Elisa para que ella pueda grabar? Ya está. Ajá. Uh, tú debes estar también aquí. 
Ahí está. Ya nombré a Lisa y a ti como co-host. ¿Ya? ¿De acuerdo? Sí, a mí ya me marcó eso. Uh -huh. ¿Comenzamos a las 12 o comenzamos cuando? No, ya. <risa> ya, ya, ya. Pero sí, ahorita. Ya nomás este, ¿qué hay? Sí, 44. Yo creo que sí. Es un buen eh, bueno, los dejo entonces Raúl, con, toma control, presenta a Elisa y luego Elisa pues tú ya y puedes compartir o hacer lo que tienes que hacer. ¿Quieres Bienvenidos que pruebe lo de compartir ahora para verificar que ah, okay. se puede ver? Uh -huh. Voy a ver si lo pongo en slideshow. Ah, ahora ahí se está. ve bien como pantalla completa, ¿verdad? Sí, es correcto. Ok, muy bien. Uh -huh. Y estaba platicando con Raúl antes de que si ustedes graban o si yo grabo. Pero... Okay, here we go. Okay, so uh, thank you very much, all of you, for uh, attending this seminar. Uh, well, uh, you know, we had uh, the welcome session last week, so this is going to be the first uh, seminar with a speaker, you know, for this semester. So this time we have. Uh, can you hear me? I can, but uh, I briefly also heard Raul and it was echoing the whole thing. Yeah. So Elise is a Finnish mathematical computer scientist with a keen interest in computational intelligence. Uh, for the past uh, 15 years, she's been a professor in, uh, uh, at the University of Nuevo León, teaching diverse aspects of discrete mathematics, computer science, to undergraduates, the graduate students, and postgraduate students of numerous programs at the Universidad de Nuevo León. And, and now she's about to embark in a new journey as Associate Professor of Applied Digital Intelligence at McGill University in, in Quebec, Canada. And she will also be the Academic Director of Technology and Innovation uh, there. Uh, well, uh, she is uh, working on all this uh, paper and uh, visa paperwork she needs to be there. Her research uh, jumps around the potential applications of graph theory and machine learning, touching areas such as uh, social sciences, medicine, economics, and forestry. She is passionate about digital learning, real time and asynchronous, and an early uh, adopter of emerging software and hardware solutions to facilitate teaching and research. Uh, after having learned Python on her own, poking around the internal for a couple of years, she now actively advocates uh, it to students and colleagues, posting YouTube links to anyone willing to check them out. And also, uh, he fa uh, she faced for uh, LaTeX, which is a tool you know, for preparing academic writing and presentations. So, Elisa, uh, thank you very much for taking your time and, and being with us today. So, we really appreciate it. Thank you very much. So, you can you can start now if you wish. Thank, thank you, Hugo, for the uh, introduction. Thank you, Raul, for the invitation. Um, okay, so let me share the presentation. Uh, the presentation is also online, so don't worry about taking notes. It's, it'll be very easy to, to access all this information. And also all the code that I have written for, for this particular paper, it's also on GitHub. So you can go poke around and, uh, and make, make fun of my choices and my um, intermediate understanding of economical sciences. So uh, this is a joint work that I've been doing with my colleague Fernando Lopez and a former student of his, Christopher. Uh, they had been working on this topic for a while and uh, playing around with like recommendation systems. And then they arrived at the point where they wanted to publish it and they brought me on board to, 
to put it a little bit uh, up to date, formal, like journal like. And it's 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 nearly okay now. The last time I checked on the journal website, it said reviews completed for the R2. So I'm just waiting for the editor to let me know if they want some other detail or if we're publishing this. So uh, what we are doing here is uh, working with financial indicators. I have this tiny little interaction tool that if you guys want to use it, you can. You can also raise your hand on Zoom if you want to. Uh, the point of the little interaction tool is for me to be able to look at in real time if you understand what's going on, if I should slow down, or if you start to have questions. So that's entirely up to you whether you want to use this in, in any way. So basically, you can click on green if everything's OK. You can click on uh, yellow if you're starting to get confused, on red if I should stop and uh, answer a question. And uh, then on the black thingy, if there's a technical problem, if you can't hear me well, if you can't see well, so I know to stop talking and, and start fixing. But this is entirely optional. I will try to also look at Zoom in case somebody has a question. So you can scan the code or type the URL up to you. I can also see if I'm smart enough to, to put it in the chat on Zoom. Zoom's so difficult. As soon as you start presenting, all the options disappear and you can't do anything anymore. Well, maybe someone else can put it in the chat. I'll just concentrate on talking. I'll try not to take forever. If you have an important question that you think that I really need to answer at this point, just interrupt me. If it's something you don't think I'm going to touch uh, later on, and if you simply need a clarification, that's entirely OK. So I'm going to first try to explain a little bit like what have other people done uh, related to, to our intended contribution here. What are the concepts? What exactly are we doing? What kind of results I have? And where would I like to, to go from here? OK, I'm going too fast. OK, so financial data. Usually what you have in financial data, whether it's stock exchange or forex exchange, is that we have prices of things. So we have a timeline, like a series of uh, measurements. What was the price at any given time? And we are working with the daily data. So in trading like Forex, which is exchanging one currency for another, like you want to sell dollars and buy pesos, or you want to sell yens and buy pit Bitcoin, uh, you have the exchange rate, which is technically the equivalent of a price here. And during a day, the price keeps varying. So we will have the highest price of the days, the uh, lowest price of the day, and then there's going to be an opening and a closing price. And in this work, we're mostly interested in the closing price of every day. And what we're trying to do is understand how is the closing price going to be one day from now, two days from now, three days from now. And I don't want to have the exact numerical value. That's a very difficult thing to forecast, like what's the exact exchange rate going to be. But if you want to invest, if you want to make any money in the Forex market, the thing you need to know is whether it's going up or whether it's going down. So what we're trying to do is like a three class uh, forecast system that's going to be able to tell you, is it going to stay stable? Is it going to go higher or is it going to go lower to a specific forecast horizon? So what do people usually do when they want to know what's going to happen with the price? They make charts like the one that I'm, I'm showing you guys right now that are the Heiken Ashi candles, which draw kind of like plots of these opening, closings, highs and lows. And you t tend to color the plots to make it easier to read. So with the Heiken Ashes, the, the plot color will be red if the price is going down and it'll be green if the price is going up. So here, the only difficult points are the days when it was still green and the next day it's red. We would like to be able to say, hey, guys, it's going to be red instead of having to wait for it to be red. So this visualization, it doesn't forecast to you the future trend. It's showing you the, uh, the present behavior of the trend. So for us, this is going to be one of our inputs. What I want to use as input are what's the logic that people these days use to try to make their decisions on whether to buy or sell? What if I take these inputs, like the Heiken Ashi candle colors, and I feed those into a machine learning system, and I tell the machine learning system to figure out what are these indicators going to look like 
if the price is going to be higher in three days? What are they going to look like if the price is going to be lower in five days? And see if it's possible to train a machine learning system to tell me what's going to happen with the trend. Another thing you can also notice if you look at this graph is there's little gaps. The Forex market for traditional currencies, it's a five days a week thing. You cannot trade during weekends. So when I'm trying to forecast for one day horizon on a Friday, I'm not talking about Saturday. I'm talking about Monday because there's little gaps. Whereas if you take a cryptocurrency like Bitcoin, there is no gaps in crypto. Crypto keeps on trading during the weekend. So there's going to be a slightly different behavior when we go to that. But just remember, we're going to first look at several indicators that real people use in their decision making. Then we're going to try to push these indicators into a machine learning system to be able to identify if this can be done, if, it's can be, uh, if it can be forecast, whether the price is going to go up or down or stay say, stable, and also which of these indicators will actually be relevant to the uh, construction of such a forecast. Another thing that people tend to do are rolling averages. They look at the price, for example, precisely the closing price, and they average over a window. Like, let's say we take a three-day average, a seven-day average, or an 11-day average. Those are the ones that I am uh, plotting here on top of the little high Ashy candles. So what we get is a curve that sometimes is above and sometimes is below the actual closing price. So this is an indicator as well. Is the current price above or below the rolling average for different lengths of the, the rolling window? So that's another input that real people use to decide, should I be buying or selling? And it's another thing we're going to be feeding into our machine learning thingy. We don't need to take linear windows and roll over those. We could also take exponential moving averages. So we get another curve. And again, what we are interested in knowing is whether the real price for today is above or below of the, the rolling average. But this, this one's an exponentially weighted one to give a higher importance to more uh, recent data and less importance to further away data. One could also calculate the MC, uh, MACD curves, which are a combination. You take two different moving average curves, and then you start comparing a fast moving average to a low moving average and looking at the differences between the two. Uh, what we're usually are looking at with the MACD is whether we have a positive or a negative value. If you want to make plots like this, all the, all the codes in the, in the GitHub, so I'll make sure you have access to that later on. Then there is a much more difficult uh, thing to read, which is the stochastic oscillator, which is a thing where we also use closings and lowest and highings and low, lowest, and we're kind of like uh, looking at how much the price is oscillating. I'm not going to take uh, 30 minutes of your life to explain all of this. Uh, the codes there, references are there. But there's tons of curves. There's tons of curves we can make. Some of them we look at a numerical value. Some of them we're interested in whether it's going up or down. Some of those we're interested in whether it's positive, negative, above the current price, below the current price. And then there's also indices that people compute. Uh, that kind of like uh, show how strong the, the currency or if it were a... a um, a stock exchange thing, uh, the, the particular stock is at this point. When we have a numerical thing like the RSI, we don't uh, binarize it like below, above, positive, negative, but we can select a discretization uh, scheme. Like let's say I'll divide it to five levels or three levels or seven levels. This index, it's usually a percentage. So we know that it's between 100, uh, well, zero and 100, or if we use it as a decimal between a zero and a one. So we kind of like choose levels there. And then we could feed that into the machine learning system that my relative strength index is on the third level or the first level or the last level instead of uh, feeding it the, the actual value of the index. 
And then there's this really, uh, really funky one that people seem to use a lot. It took me a long time to understand what's going on with this one. It's called a zigzag semaphore. And uh, what you do with the zigzag semaphore is that you use three different thresholds for price changes. And you're looking at how big the changes in the price are. And then you put these one, two, three labels onto points of time where the price changes. You put a three when it changes a lot. You put a two when it changes a medium amount. And you put a one when it changes a tiny bit. And then it's either a green or a red semaphore. Green is when we're on a maximum and red is when we're on a minimum. So if we want to use this to decide if we're buying or selling, we're interested in what's the last one. Like if I look to the recent past, oh, there was a red three, oh, or there was a uh, green one. And based on that, I will take my decisions on what I'm expecting to happen to the Forex price. Oh, another disclaimer, I would never do this with my money. I honestly think that uh, any type of currency investment, in particular crypto, only do it with the money you don't need. And I'm a professor at a public university. I do not know what that is. I don't know what money I don't need means. So I do need all of my money. I am in no way advocating on put your life savings on uh, some uh, currency exchange scene. I just think it's very interesting science because it's a very interesting time series. I am not making money with this. I have not tried making money with this and I do not recommend making money with this, but I do have friends. Um, the science people, they just uh, call them charters uh, derogatively. Uh, and they, they just look at charts like this. Every day they look at charts like this and then they make little decisions. Oh, I'm going to buy some yen. So I'm going to sell some Swiss francs. And they actually make a living out of this. I, I, don't, I don't know. It, it sounds like astrology to me. But there are people who make a living out of this. So that's the motivation why I'm interested in this. That if these people are able to do this, are they lucky? Are they smart? And is there something that we as scientists could do to kind of like capture what's the smartness here? What are we actually uh, looking at to know whether the price is going to go up or down? But that brings me to another important disclaimer. If everybody starts forecasting this, then their actions are going to depend on the output of the uh, forecasting system. And that will have an effect on what's going to be happening to the prices. Because all of these price curves are reactions to the market. So if we make large market decisions based on algorithms, then we have large fluctuations in the market. Franco is doing something very interesting. I think I'm looking at his belly. Um, and this is what happened uh, in, I don't remember the date, a few years ago there was a problem with the New York uh, Stock Exchange because they had automated algorithms. And when the algorithms look at curves like these and then they all take decisions and then the curve changes and then they all take de decisions, the whole thing becomes unstable and can collapse quite severely. So please, please, please don't try to automate this. This is in the interest of understanding a complex system. This is not in the interest of, hey guys, let's make money and collapse the markets. I I'm wondering if I can mute Franco. Um, okay, I think I can. I have effectively muted Franco and now I can see his face. Okay, so uh, traditionally people try to uh, forecast the Forex market with traditional uh, time series forecasting models. They didn't really work too well. Nonlinear models started working a little bit better. And there were some decent attempts of trying to, to forecast the forex exchange rates in the early 90s, and then entered artificial intelligence. And it's been a whole new ball game ever since. There's a lot of people working on this, and a lot of uh, interesting things are happening. So this is just a little sample of what people do. There's people working with support vector machines, neural networks, deep learning, hidden Markov models, uh, decision trees of all kinds. Some people are working with the trend like we are, if it's going up or down or stable. Some people are trying to forecast the exact exchange rate, like how many dollars per peso. Some people are trying to forecast the profit that if you're holding this amount of this currency, are you going to make a profit or a loss on it? Uh, 
the number of currency pairs people work with, it's, it's rather variable. Some people just work with one, let's say US dollar to Euro. And some people work with several. We are presently working with 15. Not because it takes a lot of time. I could work with 50. It just doesn't fit in the manuscript anymore because I have way too many figures and way too many special cases when I, when I put in uh, more currency pairs. And then also when you're training your machine learning system, what are you feeding to the system? Like I was saying, I'm working with the indicators, the, the things that people actually look at, and I'm severely discretizing the indicators. So I'm not going to be putting in the value of an index. I'm going to either set it to a few discrete levels or binarize it somehow. Some people actually feed the raw values of the indicators, and some people feed the price itself. The reason why I'm uh, happier feeding a rounded version is to try to avoid overfitting. Like, let's say, let's not give it too much information because I'm trying to see if what people actually look at as decision-making tools is sufficient input to make a machine learning method to be a functional. And a person looking at data isn't really memorizing the fifth decimal of everything. They're just looking at it. Is it big? Is it small? Is it up? Is it down? So I'm trying to kind of capture a level of detail that's accessible to human cognition and using that as input to the machine learning system. So uh, since January, it's been an evaluation for Springer's computational economics, and I am expecting it to pop out of the system relatively soon. And I can let you guys know if we get published or if I have to make more changes and figures. So. What are we going to use? Other people are working with support vector machines, neural networks. We are working with rough sets that are a really nice mathematical concept. If you have a lot of objects and these objects have attributes, multiple attributes, possibly thousands, and you're interested to know that if this set of objects is supposed to form a class, then which of these attributes permit me to differentiate this class from the other objects. So it's kind of like, um, I, I, I suppose you guys know fuzzy logic where you don't just have trues and falses, you have kind of like degrees of belonging into a set that this one's like a very good student or a very small potato. So what we have here is not kind of like a degree of belonging, but we are interested in what sets of attributes permit us to distinguish between one set of objects and another. So we're kind of like working with equivalence classes that these objects are equivalent in terms of these attributes and what subsets of attributes are good for describing which sets of objects in particular. So basically, we are wanting to figure out which attributes, so which of our features having which values, will permit me to say that this price will go up, or this price will go down, or this price will be stable to which forecasting horizon. Because it's not necessarily the same what's going to happen with the indicators if it's going to go up tomorrow, or three days from now, or one week from now, or one month from now. So the set of attributes that characterizes the subset of the prices that situations in which prices will go up may differ according to how far I'm forecasting. And the other thing that might affect it is how big of a change am I interested in? Because I really want to know if it's going to go up or down or stable. So this means that I need a threshold. How much variation can I have for it still to be stable? Is it going to go up 1%, 5%, 10%? So we have those two different things. Let's just kind of skip the math. I can make pretty equations. Uh, the important thing here is that I didn't have to program any of this. There is a very good library for... Uh, rough sets, and we're particularly using the fuzzy rough sets. So we're going to have the degrees of belonging that this, uh, this uh, set of uh, attributes here characterizes the objects that belong to this class with uh, kind of like this degree of belonging per, uh, per class. So we could say that if I'm looking at this object here, and I need to know whether it belongs to the price goes down, price is stable, price goes up. 
I can get a decimal number that, okay, it's a 0.8 here and a 0.2 here, and it's definitely not here. So um, I'm going to be rounding these values. I'm going to be picking the, uh, the maximal one. I'm not going to be reporting the fuzzy values. I'm going to be rounding them. So if the, round, the fuzzy method says that out of these three, this is the likeliest one, if it's a, let's say 0.7 likelihood, I'm like, okay, we're forecasting that one so that I don't have to have a fuzzy forecast so that it's easier for me to report things like precision recall F-score when I'm actually committing to one of the three forecasts instead of working with the fuzzy value as such. So I pick from there a, uh, a classification method. It's a, uh, it's a neighborhood-based method using 10 uh, neighbors. I'm using a Hamming distance. Why am I using a Hamming distance? Why am I not using a Euclidean distance? Because I'm really just interested in how many indicators are different. Like kind of like how far are the indicators from uh, one another? Whereas Euclidean distance would try to put numerical values to them. But since most of my indicators are yes, no indicators, it makes very little sense to use something like a uh, Euclidean distance that kind of like measures the diagonal because there is no diagonal between a yes and a no. It's either the same or it's different. So um, it's going with the Hamming distance and uh, referring to the math we looked at before that isn't really relevant for understanding this, I'm using the Q1 lower approximation. And before I start, well, I need to look at the correlations. If I have my indicators all rounded up uh, nicely to positive, negative, or whatever levels that I have, I would need to know that I'm not putting in the same exact correlated information into these indicators. So in uh, what I'm showing you guys now, I have the raw values of the indicators, the actual RSA index, the actual uh, level of the semaphore, one, two, three, the actual uh, level at which the, uh, the curves are, the colors of the Heiken ashes or the uh, differences between one and another, the price and the uh, indicator the raw values, and I check them all for correlations with one another. Evidently, variants of the same exact kind of indicator will be correlated. For example, I have the two different MACDs, one done with like the regular linear windows and another one with the exponential ones that give more weight to the recent values. It doesn't really matter which one I use, I'm getting roughly the same information. So I don't expect the both uh, MACD curves to be useful for me at one time. If I have one, I should be able to deduce the other one. But then if I look at the relationship with, between the MACDs and the other indicators, there really isn't a very high correlation. There is a with the RSA index, but if we look at the scatter plot here, there is a lot of outliers. So it's, it's not really, uh, they're not really measuring the same thing. And then for all of the others, uh, it's a similar situation. The stochastic oscillator against the, the Heiken Ashi, for example. Here also we have a, a tiny little bit of a correlation. This is the scatter plot, but also with tons of outliers. So like there's like this group of stuff and then other stuff going on. So we can see that this is not necessarily a heterogeneous situation. The same thing when I'm comparing the uh, moving averages to the relative strength index, there seem to be kind of like subpopulations with the different uh, values of the index. Uh, and it's not like none of this really looks in any way uniform, regular or free of noise. And very few of these kind of look uh, normally distributed. The RSI is the closest. At the semaphore level, of course, this is a discretized thing because it's a one, two, three, and the kind is the green or red, so they're definitely not going to be normally distributed. This one seems bimodal. These two also seem bimodal with lots of noise. And, uh, and these ones here, they're kind of like biased towards the left. This might be possibly normal. I didn't really check normality on, on any of these because they don't look horribly normal. So I have faith that when I feed this information, the only redundancy should really be within a family, that if I feed in several SMAs, they might be uh, redundant with each other, several EMAs, they might be redundant to each other, or several MACDs, they might be redundant to each other. Yet, I am going to feed in several SMAs. Why? Because I need to know which one I want to look at. Remember with the uh, 
the moving averages, I have different windows. I can have a three day window, seven day window, 21 day window. So of course the 21 day window is going to contain information that the seven day window contains also. But when I forecast to different lengths of the forecast window, I might require a different window length of the indicator. And that's one of the things I wanna check. By the way, these correlations are uh, for the exchange rate between the United States dollar and the Mexican peso. So I have actually 15 of these uh, for all of the currency pairs and they're roughly uh, qualitatively similar, all of them. So nobody has their hands up, nobody has yellows or reds, so I think we're fine. So I'm gonna extract this information from real data. So I download uh, five years of data for the 15 currency pairs and I start computing these. I select a bunch of window lengths for the rolling averages. I have a three day, five day, seven day, nine day and 11 day. Then I calculate the high Kanashi candles. I calculate the semaphores. I calculate the stochastic oscillator. I calculate that for the SMA 14. In future work, we could try with more windows for the SO. But as I already have a bunch of indicators and it's difficult to fit the tables in the paper, I'm trying to not exaggerate. I am using a five level discretization for the RSI index. And for most of the others, uh, it's just binary except remember that the semaphore has a three level thingy. So we have a uh, positive or negative in comparison to the price rising or falling above or below or the sign for the MSADs. And the exceptions are the RSI, which is the five level of an index that goes from zero to one or zero to hundred if you're looking at a percentage and the semaphore does the one, two, three thing. For the forecast horizons and the change thresholds, I need to choose what values I want to test. And then when I know that, let's say I'm looking at three days from now and a 5% change, then I will take my uh, time series and I will calculate the values of the time series for a given day. Then I will look at the price the horizon forward from that day. And I will compare those two prices to see if there was a change that exceeded the threshold, true or false, and if the change was positive or negative. So given the, uh, the data that characterizes a moment, I make a label that's two binary values. That's the, uh, did it change upwards or downwards? Uh, or which is the, the second bit. And the first one, whether there was change larger than the threshold or whether there wasn't. So now if there wasn't significant change in the threshold, it doesn't matter if it was an increase or a decrease. So even if it looks like I have four classes, I don't actually have four classes, I have three classes. I have the significant increase, significant decrease or insignificant. And I don't care if it's a decrease or an increase. So I'm going to be using forecast horizons of one, two, three, four, five days, then 10 days and 15 days. Why am I not using seven or 14? Remember, most of this is traditional currency and they don't trade on Saturdays and Sundays. So multiples of five are essentially the weeks. I'm also going to be experimenting with Bitcoin, but for comparability of the results, I'm going to use these same horizons with the Bitcoin. And I'm going to be using 15 different thresholds. I have five small thresholds. I have five medium thresholds and five large thresholds. So notice these are percents. So the largest is a 3% change. The smallest is a 0.01% change. So it's a very small amount. Okay. So my class labels, as I was saying, come from those binary values. The uh, significant increase, I'm gonna call that a two. A significant decrease, I'm gonna call that a zero. And the uh, whatever change there was doesn't exceed the threshold, I'm gonna call that one. So I'm gonna have zero, one, two class labels. What does the data look like? For a given day, I have the discretized values of the indicators, and then I have the forecast, that's the desired label that I calculate by looking that much to the future into the data. So I can extract a huge bunch of data like this, 
that these are the indicators, this is the label I want. These are the indicators, this is the label I want. This particular example, this is the Australian dollar against the US dollar using a two-day horizon and a 1% threshold. So that's just a little fragment. Remember, I have five years of data for each of the uh, 15 pairs. The first thing we got to do is feature selection, because as we saw here, there's a bunch of features. I have five normal rolling averages, five exponential ones, the high Kanashi, the two different sides of the little semaphore thingy, uh, the um, stochastic, stochastic oscillator, the relative strength index, two different kinds of MACDs. So I would like to know which ones of these are actually necessary and useful for making a forecast. So we don't want features that give us the same exact information than another feature. This is uh, avoiding redundancy. We don't want to put features that are just kind of like nice to have, but don't really do anything so that we don't get too much uh, overfitting. And also less features we put into the system, less time we're going to need for the training. The same package that I used for the classification, it also comes with feature selection methods. I just need to kind of like uh, poke around their code a tiny bit because I needed to see, I wanted to see which features it selected. Library itself, it selects the features and trains and everything's nice and warm, but uh, it doesn't tell you which ones it picked. And I needed to know which ones it picked because I wanted to contribute that exact thing with my research, which of these indicators are necessary to be able to forecast which currency to which precision to which for, uh, forecast horizon. So there's a tiny uh, change between my code and the, the original library. So when we start training the models, first we need to make sure that I have enough data. So I'm going to check how many twos, how many ones, and how many zeros do I have. Some prices, they fluctuate a ton. So there is never going to be stability for a more uh, slow threshold. And it doesn't make any sense to try to train a three classifier when one of the three classes doesn't exist. So if in the, uh, in the data set I had less than 30 occurrences of one of the three classes, I threw it out. Like, no, we're not going to forecast this. We're simply not going to take this. We're just going to forecast uh, two of the classes. And note, it isn't always the stable class that goes away. Some exchange rates, they're just kind of like almost always increasing. They never go down a lot. So if I have a large uh, threshold, then the price is either going to be stable or rising, stable, stable, rising, stable, stable, rising, but it's never going to go down. And this is a common case with, uh, with many currencies that one can just for a very long time uh, be gaining on another. So I always had to check if any of the three classes was a minority. Then before I start training the model, I need to balance the classes. Because if one class has a lot more than the other, I'm going to get uh, a biased situation. If I train with tons of uh, samples from one class and very few from the other. So first I balance the classes. After I balance, I'm going to do the split to testing and training. Then I am going to train uh, the uh, with the features that the feature selection chooses. But I'm not going to send all of my training data for the feature selection because that's a long, uh, heavy algorithm. So I just take a random sample of the training data to do feature selection. Then I reduce the set of inputs to the selected features and train a classifier. With the classifier, I make the prediction. And that's a fuzzy prediction. So it has the decimal values that you're 0.2 this class, your 0.5 this class, and your 0.3 this class. So I am going to there pick the largest one as my forecast. And then when I have those crisp forecasts that for every single uh, test data, I put what did the model say, I can now compute the F score by comparing the expected label that I knew that should happen with the uh, what did the machine say when I presented it the past data to present the, the known date. OK, so why am I working with the F-score? Uh, the F-score, it's a balanced measure of precision and recall. And the main reason to work with something like this is because the table you put in your paper or your thesis is smaller because now one value, F-score, lets you look at both precision and recall. 
when you're doing a thesis and you can make a 200 page document, go ahead, put a different table for precision and recall and F score. But if you try that in a journal, your uh, reviewers will have some opinions about this because they don't like tables. So you just try to compress the information to something that's balanced, informative, and can be looked at. And yeah, my tables are still going to be huge. Experimentally, since the characterization of the data, the extraction of the indicators is completely deterministic, I don't have to do any replicas on that. I just characterize and that's it. But when I'm training, the part where I split the input data into training and test, that's probabilistic. And I'm also doing the feature selection on a subset, so that's probabilistic. So that's why I'm going to be running replicas for the training part. And since I have several horizon threshold combinations, I need to replicate for every combination separately. This has been run on the machine that's here right uh, next to me. Uh, it's running Ubuntu. Uh, most of what uh, is the machine learning parts, it's run uh, with the bash script uh, on Python programs, whereas the analysis and visualization of the data, there's R and a tiny bit of GNU plot involved there. All the data is free to access. It's coming from finance.yahoo.com, 15 pairs, five years. And at my GitHub, the repository is called Forex, where I've put the code. The data isn't there because the data isn't mine, but the data is really easy to go download from, from Yahoo. If you can't find it, just hit me up and I'll help you. So first, you get the price data, you calculate the indicators, and then those indicators give you the features because you need to get the binary values and the discretized levels. You choose your uh, forecast horizon, you choose your threshold for how big the change needs to be. And now this allows you to compute class labels for the data that you have. Then you need to check if uh, you have at least two classes with data because if all of the data is prices increasing, you, it doesn't make any sense to classify. It's going to be a perfect classifier. If it's always increasing, it's always increasing and you're done. Don't make it like it's your achievement that your classifier got 100%. Any ideal classifier gets 100% if you only have one class. So we're not going to train for the ones that would only have one class. If there's at least two classes and uh, neither one of them is super dominant, then we will actually train. We do the split. We balance the classes. Uh, also, after the split, you really need to check that both of the classes are uh, still present. If after the split, that's not true, you just need to try again. If it's impossible to split it in a way where both classes are adequately present after 10 times, well, then skip this. Then we do the feature selection. Uh, we're using uh, 50. Uh, of the 70%, not 50% of the 70%, but we just pick 50 samples of the, uh, the training data to feature select. Then we build a classifier using all of the training data. And then we do the prediction for the test data. That was the 30%. That gives us the F score. And then we just do 30 replicas of this. OK, so what do I get? I get these monster tables. And this is a small subset of a monster table because I am only showing those classifiers that got an F score at least 95%. Every single of the 15 currency pairs gives at least some classifiers that are above an 80%, whereas the euro to the Chinese currency, no, the euro to the Swiss franc and the US dollar to the Chinese currency, those are the ones that uh, don't have a 95% F-score classifier. Okay, and uh, things that we want to notice here, for a bunch of the combinations, the stable class isn't really... Uh, easy to, to, to get because when we use small thresholds, you see that all of these uh, classifiers that have the F, F score over 95, they're all for small thresholds. It's the T column, 0, 0, 001, 0, 0, 0.02. So these are all very small. And when there's a very small threshold, you cannot really have a stable price because any tiny change is uh, higher than the threshold. So the frequency columns here show me how many data points did I have with a significant decrease, stable, and significant increase. So 25% of the total combinations 
didn't have the stable class. And of the ones shown here, none of them had over 30 samples in the stable class. I've uh, colored in blue the ones where the lowest F score over the 30 replicas was over 0.7. So we can see that there are some currencies where all of the replicants do, uh, do a pretty decent job in forecasting a very small price change, particularly the US, uh, Australian dollar to the US, Euro to the US, and the USD to the Mexican peso. The interesting thing here is what are the indicators that are being picked? Nearly every single time we're using the RSI, the Relative Strength Index. This is probably because it's the richest indicator because I'm using five levels of discretization on it and most of the others are binary or ternary. I also put the runtime of the feature selection in milliseconds, average and standard deviation over the replicas and the training time of the model also in milliseconds, so the training is much faster than the feature selection. This is why the feature selection is done on a very small subset. And uh, here I put the number of total data points. So it should be the sum of these values here should go here. So we can observe that the RSI is almost always used. A very short uh, three day Rolling average is also pretty popular, and most of the other indicators don't really enter into it. Sometimes the CD, but not really the others. So this is where I really want to start diving in. If I take the frequency of using an indicator over all of the classifiers for each of the currency pairs, we can see that the RSI is sometimes used 100% of the time, and most of the time it's super dominant. So if I take it away, what's gonna happen? Will I still be able to forecast if I don't let the machine learning look at the RSI anymore? So that's exactly what I do. I, after the one where everybody is and RSI is dominant, I do another five uh, experimental setups. I get rid of the RSI and the MACD starts getting popular and the F scores are still very similar. Then uh, what I am going to do, I'm gonna get rid of both RSI and MACD. The exponential moving averages, they start entering as used features and the high Kanashi candles too. The scores are still similar. If I only use RSI with the SMA, the uh, regular moving averages, I'm still forecasting just fine, just with those. If I get rid of the regular ones and I instead of them use the exponential ones, the Chinese Yuan starts getting very problematic. I cannot really forecast it properly anymore. If I only use the SMA by itself, if I have short horizons and more thresholds, I can still do this, meaning, that such a ridiculously small thing as whether the rolling average is above or beneath the present price alone seems to be sufficient to be able to figure out what's going to happen in the future. Okay, so for my six experimental setups, these are the frequencies of the inclusions of the indicators. So we can see that the uh, the regular rolling average thingies, those are pretty popular. The shorter ones are more popular than the longer ones. The exponential ones, they really only shine when we throw out the relative uh, uh, strength index. And uh, the, the, the kind of the semaphore, whether it's, red, whether it's red or green, that's pretty irrelevant. The other indicators give us this information, but the level sometimes useful. The RS, uh, RSI by itself, that's, uh, that's a very strong indicator, very informative of what's going on. So what do these uh, models look like when I look at their performance? Here I'm plotting the F score over the replicas, the worst replica and the best replica, worst replica, best replica. And here I'm varying the horizon for how many days in the future I'm forecasting. So remember it was one through five, then 10 and then 15. And I had five thresholds of three magnitudes, small, medium and large. When the bar is missing, 
it means that we didn't have any reasonable models for it. We couldn't train models. So why can't we train models? It's because there's only one class, meaning that if the threshold's very large and I want to look at a very short horizon, uh, it's never going to be increasing or decreasing. It's always going to be stable. Or if I have a super uh, small threshold and I have a very large horizon, I can also possibly have difficulties with this because it, it might really never be stable there. Okay, so I plotted here a line at 0.7, which is kind of like my personal opinion that if your F score is well below 0.7, don't even talk about it. Uh, this is a 0.8 which is kind of means that, okay, we could start pretending it's, it's possibly a decent classifier. So when we look at for Euro to Canadian dollar, we have for all of the horizons, some nearly acceptable uh, classifiers. We have decent ones really only for the one day horizon. And the larger the threshold goes, the worse the situation tends to get, but there's a little rebound. Like they go bad and then they start getting a little better again. Meaning that if you're forecasting further away, it's easier to forecast for a larger threshold. This is also intuitively pleasant. So this is what it looks like for Bitcoin. And this is interesting. There's a qualitative difference between Bitcoin and regular currency. For short horizons, Bitcoin is a little bit easier to forecast. And whereas for regular currencies, large uh, long horizons and large thresholds usually gets better. With Bitcoin, it doesn't. With Bitcoin, there's no decent way looking at these indicators to know what's going to happen long term. So we do better short term, but we do worse long term when we're comparing a traditional to a crypto. In future work, it would be really interesting also to include crypto to crypto things, but uh, I have so many slides and papers and uh, tables uh, that it just really doesn't make a lot of sense to extend too much. The Chinese uh, Yuan, that's uh, the most complicated one to forecast with the method that I have, it's almost never good. Like it's between uh, kind of sucks and uh, totally impossible. There's something in that, uh, particular currency that makes it behave in a different way. This kind of implies that we would need a different indicator, that the indicators that people usually use aren't powerful or descriptive of the Chinese uh, currency's behavior. So how does this computationally perform? I have a, a, a 16 core i7 and 64 gigabytes of RAM. That's mostly because I play video games, but as a side effect, I can use this to, to do some research. So the characterization, that's nice. Uh, five years of a currency pair takes a couple of seconds to do. Uh, the feature selection, if I take a small sample, it's very quick, reasonable, uh, totally less than a second. But if I start putting all of the data in it, it's uh, really not nice anymore. You could want to spend an entire day on this, but I don't want to. Because when I'm doing 30 replicas for each combination, I have seven horizons, I have uh, 15 thresholds, 15 currency pairs. I, I want this whole thing to run in a few hours. So in my computer, I press enter, I you know, walk to Starbucks or something, come back. The whole experiment's going to be done and I have the new figures. So that's, that's my personal research goal. If it can be done in a day, do it in a day because you're always too busy to spend 15 days running the experiments and I just don't have the infrastructure for that. I'm glad for the guys at Google who do, but no, I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna run my computer for 15 days for the sake of science. I like playing games in the evenings. So to compare what we're doing, I also checked out what would happen if I just used decision trees. So I also trained decision trees. Uh, for this particular decision tree, I threw in the relative strength index and one of the regular uh, rolling average thing is. The decision tree, it already starts getting kind of complicated with only these two things. And the F score, uh, even if I use all of the data, I didn't do a split, I just gave it all of the data to see how, uh, how this goes. Uh, it goes to 0.77. So even if I risk overfitting, I can't do really very well with a decision tree. But if I try to make a decision tree with all the features, it becomes 
incomprehensible. Like you don't really know which features are doing what and the performance goes poor. So what I really like about what we're doing is I can tell which features are the ones that are being used. My downside is I don't really know how they're being used. I don't really have access to the logic. So I can make a forecast given current values. I can predict whether it's going to go up or down. This is kind of fast. I get relatively good models, but I want to know why. So I'd like to add indicators to make the Chinese currency work better. I would try to uh, also change the RSI discretization. It's a five level now. What do I do if I make it finer, if I make it coarser, what's going to happen? What if I discretize the others instead of finerizing them, if I gave them like four levels or something, is are they going to become more useful? I would like to make use of the fuzziness. Like remember my class labels, they're 0 0.8, 0 0.2, 0 0.7, and I'm just rounding them to yes or no's. So that would be a very interesting thing to do. Like, can I get better performance if I actually look at that fuzzy value? It would be cool to test different feature selectors and different classifiers because I'm just using one method for feature selection and just one roughy classifier. And now I have a typo. I always have a typo, but it's almost the last slide. I also want to visualize the rough sets, kind of like to explain to the person making the forecast, which are the attributes that are being used and how are they being used? How do their values forecast this? All my work is with daily data, and I would like to work with hourly or minute level data because the forecast market tends to be short term, so that might be more interesting. And it would be cool to check how much of this can be transferred to stock market data. So if anybody's in the market for a case study for their doctoral thesis or wants to work with something like this, I volunteer for the committee and I will share you everything I have. Uh, even if it's not financial data, if it's something that does something similar, I'll, I'll be happy forecasting climate change or whatnot. So there's a lot of other indicators that I already know how to calculate. There's stuff like auto correlations that we could, we could be showing uh, also to the classifier that weren't included here. I just started with a subset of stuff that uh, I know from the people I know who invest in this that real people are actually using. There are some references to the uh, papers that I mentioned. As said, uh, these slides are in the same GitHub repository as the code. I'm going to fix that one typo because I'm uh, autistic enough to be bothered by it. You are all free to contact me to my email at any point. Try to use the Gmail instead of the uh, YNL uh, email because, well, I hope to be switching to McGill soon. So the the official one that I have now might stop working at some time. You can scan that to get to my uh, migratory web page. I have a web server running here at home, but since I'm about to sell the apartment, I don't know how long that's going to run. So I've been uh, migrating it to GitHub IO. So there's some stuff there that you guys can, can use to get to my publications and, and other info on me. But I would be really, really interested to know what kinds of comments, ideas, and questions you guys have regarding what I have said. I'm going to stop sharing so you guys don't have to stare at this. But uh, if you need to look at these slides again, just let me know. Uh, thank you very much, Elisa. Nice presentation. There are some uh, comments, questions in the chat. Could okay. you take a look at them, please? Let's see. Uh, rough sets is like choosing the most correlated variables. Um, it's not really in terms of uh, correlation. When rough sets, it's kind of like co-occurrence. So basically, when you have an attribute, like, like so let's say the, uh, the semaphore that has the one, two, three, and then the red or green. So we would have a set of data that these are all the ones that have a semaphore level one. And these are all the ones that have a green. So rough sets works kind of like with these subsets, that if these are all the greens and these are all the ones, then the intersection of those are all the green ones. So it's, it's a set theoretical kind of a thing where you're trying to figure out which attributes are descriptive about uh, which label would go to which class. 
So they were just trying to f figure out that if adding a new attribute doesn't change, let's say the support, if adding a new attribute doesn't give you any more separation between the classes, then that attribute is kind of like redundant. So what you were trying to figure out is how you could in like set theoretical terms roughly describe what do these points have in common and then the classification comes from kind of that that this is the class of the ones that have a green semaphore at level five and a negative difference in the high and ashy and blah 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 and then you want to take that to your class labels like what are the attributes that give you significant increase what are the what are what's the subset of the no significant, no significant change, etc. So that's it's rough sets. It's it's, it's kind of cool, but when you read like math about rough sets, it's it's really just uh, set theory. Um, for the uh, feature selection, um, I really haven't tried any other methods yet, and I haven't speculated yet on which ones would be nice. Uh, it's an interesting future work, and I'm kind of hoping to, to tempt a student to doing it, to comparing uh, different types of feature selection methods, either like incremental, like uh, take nothing at first and then add, or take everything first and then throw out, or some probabilistic methods that would be interesting. Uh, Enrique, this is the paper that's presently uh, in review I could see if there's any news on the web page about whether they're actually going to spit it out, but like it's 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 hopefully soon uh, published, and I will add it to my list of publications, of course, as soon as I I get the information that they actually accepted it. But uh, all the slides and all the code, it's already there. I'm really hoping it's going to pop out soon. If it doesn't, I'm going to put it on ArcSiv or something to to get it to you guys faster. But usually, like, if, if you want to follow me on something like LinkedIn or Twitter, if I manage to get a paper out, I usually brag about it for my 15 seconds of fame. So you're going to notice there. Uh, I have no idea how quantum computing will affect trading none whatsoever. Um, I would suppose that uh, my best guess would be not really. I'm a little worried about how quantum computing will affect information security, but I don't think that's like a short term concern. That's a medium term concern. But yeah, quantum computing methods for forecasting in general are interesting, but that takes it even further to the fuzzier direction. And I think there's a lot of uh, potential in, in kind of fuzzy classification and a forecasting that isn't really just spit out a number, but kind of like qualitative forecasting, where we're not going to say what's the value of this series going to be, but it would kind of be, uh, what what qualitatively will be happening. And I think that would be very, very interesting. Uh, for Jose Carlos's question on the, the smotes, um, I didn't really try either the, if there is an effect of uh, whether I use a different sampling method, because like I usually start messing with the sampling method when I don't get any good classifiers. And when I already get more classifiers than I can fit on the table that have a good F score, I'm like, yeah, oh, fuck it. I'll just analyze whatever I have. And, uh, but when your method isn't working well, when like all of your classifiers suck and nothing's working, then it's a very good idea to start uh, checking if, uh, if another option would be viable. I considered for a little while uh, the uh, starting to oversample the, the minority class, but there are such strong minorities. It's like 20 of these, 500 of these, and 500 of these. So even if I try to sample those same 20 over and over again, I really think I'm just going to introduce a huge bias. Like when the differences are massive, I have very little faith that by oversampling, I would get to something reasonable. I think it more just means that this threshold and horizon combination doesn't really make sense when you get imbalanced classes. So it's not so much of a sign like, hey, let's sample another way. 
It just means that the question I am making doesn't make sense. And hence, I really shouldn't be making that question. That's, uh, that's my interpretation of uh, what's actually happening when I get really imbalanced classes. So I'm not interested in fixing it. I'm interested in admitting that, okay, this combination doesn't work. Uh, what's the other question? Uh, oh, I, st I still have one in the chat. One, one, one moment. Uh, have I raised this problem using a GRU LSTM hybrid network? No, I, I, I didn't try anything else personally than the rough sets because that's what my uh, co-workers had been working on, Fernando and uh, Chris. But in the related literature, I saw a lot of people doing uh, pretty heavy neural network things on this. But now with my experience of what I have done thus far, I don't think you need to, because I, I have a very, let's say, lightweight method here. And this very lightweight method that you can run even on a much more modest computer with just a few discretized indicators, if this is already doing well, why would I want to bring in the big guns? I'm more interested in uh, exploring other, let's say, light approaches to this. Because similarly than the, uh, the let's start oversampling, the let's bring a more complex solution, it makes sense when the simple one isn't working. But when the simple one is kind of working, to me, the interesting questions are, why is it working? Can I make it work even better? And how much of the, hey, it seems to be working, depend on the different elements already present. But yeah, there's a lot of, uh, in, the, in the references, there's a bunch of stuff that, that are using neural networks, deep learning, all kinds of variants on, on doing this. I am multitasking here to put the typo corrected version of the slides on the GitHub repository. Did somebody else have a question still? Ramon has uh, his hands, his hand okay. raised. Go ahead. Yeah, um, I, you mentioned that actually the Chinese yen is kind of difficult to, to predict. And I was wondering yeah. if, uh, if you have checked if there is a kind of human intervention in, in fixing the, the values of it, because, you know, the human mind is, of course, unpredictable, or, or, or at least. The, the government people in the Chinese who are pulling the strings for that, for that it's Im almost impossible to predict what is going to, to happen exactly. Mm -hmm. So if that is the case, that would perhaps explain why the performance is not going to be, it's impossible to have it right, isn't it? What do you think? Yeah, that I, when I was talking about this a lot with my, uh, my friend who actually does forex trading for a living, uh, he said that there's a lot of like extra financial factors, like stuff like world events, political things, uh, things that happen with larger companies, policy changes, even climate things affect this. So one interesting thing would be to forecast the price changes, but using as an input also socioeconomic uh, data that isn't the price itself because stuff like how many storms are there in the Pacific or if there was an earthquake somewhere or whether Elon Musk said something stupid or whether Putin is doing something criminally insane in Europe, all of this also affects the price. And that's not something we can look in, the, look at the price history and tell, oh, hey, Russians are gonna do something dumb. It doesn't show there, it shows somewhere else. And I'm thinking that the problem that the Chinese one is behaving differently is possibly due to China having like um, either a more robust or a more volatile, let's say, relationship with, between these like extra financial factors. So maybe they have a very different political situation. So all these hidden political factors that I cannot deduce by looking at these purely price-based indicators might be affecting. So that's what my uh, real life Forex trading friend was really interested in, in how to make indicators that would like 
monitor activity on Twitter, monitor headlines on CNN and kind of like bring that into what's going on to forecast in terms of what Twitter and CNN are doing instead of just forecasting in terms of the past price. Yeah, of course. Thank you. There is another question in chat from Luis Daniel on what would be the best regression model for forecasting. Uh, I, I don't think any of them are very good. It's, it's, um, I've been recently uh, kind of struggling with this, uh, how to forecast these kinds of things and uh, none of them were really good. And that's kind of, uh, that's one of the things that the existing literature like pre machine learning existing literature points out that you cannot really forecast forex with the traditional methods and the traditional math includes exactly kind of like regression type of things like it doesn't seem to to behave that way i'm not really sure why it doesn't seem to behave that way but like when you fit a decision tree, you're internally kind of making uh, regression models and they're really not kind of performing well. But my understanding from reading the literature is that the consensus is no regression model will be best for trading forecasting in general. That, 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 that simply doesn't seem to work. What seems to work are different variants of machine learning and nobody really seems to yet know why exactly. Okay, thank you very much. I, I think we are uh, almost closing this because we, we almost, uh, our time is up. So we really uh, thank you, Elise, again, because it's been really, not only the presentation, but I think all the discussion that you have also presented is, is very good for, for everyone here. So, uh, <laughs> It's just difficult to detect what you're saying, Raul. Yeah, Raul, you're really difficult to understand. If you can have somebody there type it up for you, it would be easier. Yeah, no, no problem. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we understood that. Yeah, okay. that, that thank was, you that very much. Part. All right. There, so thank you all of you for attending this seminar. Next uh, week, uh, we will be sending a message because it's the uh, Research Congress at Tech. So we are going to invite you to register in the Congress and attend some lectures there. So we won't have a, a, a seminar on Friday, all right? So, uh, so be alert on the, uh, on the email there. Thank you very much. Thank you guys.